Well, I have to talk about something very, very important, and I, I never even know where to begin because this is such a long journey and such a process in my in the last four or whatever years since uh, the beginning of this miracle has happened in my life. And so I start talking from the end of many thoughts, and it just causes a lot of confusion and fights and stuff amongst the brethren of the church because they don't understand what, what I'm talking about because they don't understand how I got to my conclusion. And they don't understand what I'm talking about when I'm talking about whatever I talk about. It just it, it ends up being so many fights and so much confusion. And I hope, I hope to God that I can reveal the message in a way that would make complete, perfect sense to anybody who hears it. Because I have a lot to say in correction to the church today, but I'm not here to destroy the church in any means. I'm not here to fight the devil. I'm here. I mean, I'm not here to fight the church. I'm here to fight the devil. That's what I'm here for. And I'm here to bless the church, and 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 hopefully the church can get to the best place possible. And I need I need that to happen just as much as anybody does. And I'm not anybody special, but something special really happened to me, and I feel like I need to, to say something about it. So my message today is basically kind of like why I talk about the things I talk about, and why do I sound like I'm always railing on the church. And I'm really, it's really not that I'm railing on the church, I'm really here to rail on things that just aren't right. So I figured if I start from where I was at in the beginning, this whole thing would make a lot more sense to everybody, hopefully. But being in the church all of my life, I, I had just kind of gone along with what I believed in, and I, I believed in Jesus, I accepted him at a young age, as far as I knew, I didn't know how to do it any other way than what was told to me, and I did it the best I could, and I was very serious about it, and I, I when I got into sin when I was about 18 years old, I I definitely didn't like it, I felt really, really bad, and continued to go in that direction, and I didn't really have any type of real supernatural thing to draw me back in there, only just, it just seemed wrong to me in some way, but... Needless to say, I got into sin big time when I was 18, and it just got worse and for a while, and got back and forth in there, and something really powerful happened to me. The Lord started to move in my life at that time for a couple years, and I got back into some big traps, and I just, it, I just ended up choosing, to, choosing the flesh and the world instead of God. And 14 years later, I decided to go back to that touch that I had experienced when I was 18, 19, and 20, and I gave up everything that I had been in at that time. And by that time, I had so much stuff that had raveled up in my life that it that to repent on God's terms was actually pretty significant because it was like stealing. And in Leviticus it says if you steal something, to make it right, you have to fix the problem for one and then wait until the Lord cleanses you again. First you're ceremonially unclean, even when you confess it, and then later on you're free. And there's a, there's a true freedom that is a reality in the Christian's life that I believe a lot of Christians haven't, touched the, the heaviest place of that thing because I've touched a place that was heavier than most of the places that I've seen in my whole life and in that very holy place a lot of the things I normally did and called normal Christian life didn't make any sense at all and so when I see people doing those things I feel as if they might not have seen that same thing that I've seen and I've seen that same exact miracle described by a lot of the great giants of his in the history like Jar Charles Finney and J John Wesley and J uh, George Whitfield and just on and on through the history, they've described something like that, and they've taken it to such a far, far level, like Spurgeon, just giants like that. And they describe something of this miracle that costs so much. And, and so when I see things done a little funny, it, it really confused me, because I sensed something real about it, but I couldn't quite figure out why it didn't make any sense compared to the miracle. Like, it was like an ingredient, like a recipe for something cool, and it was positive, but it didn't make sense according to the miracle that I had touched before, which I would consider to be the living water Jesus spoke about. And so I've had a hard time describing this to people for a long time, and I'm just hoping that I can somehow describe that again. So when I was 31 years old, I decided to give up everything I could think of. Anything that had to do with, like, sensual sin, I said anything like that, I'm not going to do that anymore. And I publicly said it, I'm not going to do these things anymore, I'm not going to go to these clubs anymore. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to be around women in a certain way anymore, and I'm not going to be in music anymore, the rock and roll band that I had done for such a long time, which I picked as an idol over God. And not that long after that, the Spirit of the Lord started to move, and I started to experience 
some really extreme moments with God, extreme so much where I can touch somebody and they would be healed instantly, which is different than being in a spiritual gift and just touching someone and they get healed whenever. It's, it's not the spiritual gift of healing. It was walking in the, in the now presence of God. I think it's something much different. And I, I actually experienced that for a little while. And then I got to a place where God said nothing to me. There was no presence. There was no nothing going on at all. It was really dry. And in that time, I even got baptized. And it was a, it was dry as a, as a bone until I got baptized. And then even that, God still like had something to deal with me. And I couldn't figure out what it was. And so I tried to take it to the next level. I know I gave up all this other stuff. And I didn't know if there was something else I had to do that was grieving his spirit. Well, it turns out that there was. Because I used to steal a lot of money. And I decided that I had to give the money back. And as soon as I started talking like that, and getting on God's language, I was like, if I could check the money, i got to give it back. And the presence of the Lord just came into me, like, <laughs> until I was absolutely in the glory of God. So it was like a literal infilling. It was the glory of God. I could in supernaturally see something that absolutely dazzled me to no end. It was an answer to my prayer, because I was like, what do I have to do to be with you, Lord? And in that, he answered me. He took me into the realms of glory where I was literally like a hundred miles off the earth looking with Jesus at the earth from his perspective trying to figure out what he wanted me to do and then and then I, I just knew I knew I like I have to turn myself in I've got to sell all the stuff I bought with dirty money I got to give all the money back to the companies I stole from I got to change all the stuff that I had to do and reverse everything to make it right with to make it right just to bring it back to where it was that, that made perfect sense in the glory realm and a lot of people I speak that they don't understand that and I'm like well that's because we don't understand that super that miracle level of truth and so that's kind of where it was but in that miracle it's like he was kind of showing me his house and I, he was showing me his house for a specific purpose but being that close to God I could see something else I could see the difference between how he sees things and how I've always seen things before and so I'm trying to tell the people who have seen it that way all along how it's supposed to be seen according to the Lord Jesus Christ and, and his word, I believe. And I believe we've, we've kind of angled the, the word of God to take a few things out of here to do things that are positive and that makes a lot of sense and they feel really good and they bring some kind of fruit, but they don't bring that living water and they don't bring that miracle that causes us to do the good commission of God. I don't believe the commission is in motion as it should be because the true living water that God is trying to put in his church isn't a reality now. That's a big statement, I know. But there's not a lot of it going on right now. More or less, we have become like a third generation religion that is not where we're supposed to be. It's not, it's not a perfect expression of God's church. So I love the church, and I just want to see the church go to the best place. And like, hopefully everybody who's in the church will, will catch on to this vision, the revival vision, the true end time revival vision. It's going to be more powerful than anything this earth has ever seen before. And to go there is going to cost us a great deal, a lot more than we think it is. And we pray those kind of prayers, but what we do with our, with what, what, we, what, what, we, what we do with what we're doing, we haven't really sacrificed anything. We, we, we've said it and we've prayed those big prayers, but we haven't actually done it, a lot of us. And when I actually accidentally did something, I was just like, I just want to go there and I just did it. I accidentally abandoned myself and it was just enough because that was all I knew to do. I did all the best I could do. And then God met me and told me I had so much further to go. And so I've been working on that for a long time and in there learning a lot of important lessons and see how see how much I want to really fight for this anointing. It is not as easy as I thought it would be. But the reason I fight people all the time, the reason I sound like I'm always railing on the church is because I don't see them going in the right path and a lot of the revivalists today are still talking like that they're still calling us to go away from these things that seem like they're working but they're more like copying the world and if the church is copying the world and they're trying to win the world to be like themselves it's just a big circle and it doesn't make any sense it doesn't make doesn't make sense that we're copying them and trying to tell them to be like us so it's just it makes no sense and i want to see us get to a place where the living water flows through the church again and we start to preach the gospel expecting to see a regenerate life that proves that they literally had an encounter with God. Because the revivalists say that you're not even truly a Christian until that miracle has happened to you. And I'm not quite sure the exact way to lay that out, but something of that is very true. I know there's something very simple about it, but I also know that there's something very powerful about it too. And I personally haven't found the exact wording to describe that miracle. I'm not that mature yet. A lot of the people ahead of me and behind me who have walked in that power far greater than I have,
can explain it a far lot better. So I always point people to those people because I would rather them get under leadership like that because I'm not even leadership yet. I just have seen this thing, but I want to still describe this very thing. So, having said that, some of the things I think that the church really needs to take a look at Not look at it, is to not look at the miracle like it's a snap of fingers away. It's not really according to what we think. It's not according to what we want or believe. It's according to what God is is really doing and what He's up to. You know, I mean, His word stands firm in this thing. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God stands forever. And I believe when He speaks His word out, this thing is a really solid thing that we can constantly lean on all the time. And I don't believe it's really changed that much. And I know God does new things, but I believe it, His new things are always done on top of a true foundation. And we, 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 we shift the way we look at that truth, so we're saying the right words, but the miracle sometimes is not really a, a reality in our lives. And it causes us to launch out and grab for things that cause some type of a new nurturing to our soul, but God still maybe not be in total control in those situations, and that's the problem. So a lot of the times when I'm talking about stuff, people don't understand what I'm talking about because they think they think it's too extreme or something like that. But I'm like, the reason why I'm saying that is like, you know, people say, is that what made? Is that why you came to the Lord? Because someone told you what you're telling us now? And I say, absolutely not. I say that's not true. But I wish to God that they did talk to me like that. Then I would know better how to hold on to it. You know, the Lord talks about people coming to the Lord and then and having it be slipping away because they didn't know how to hold on to it. They didn't they didn't know how to count the cost originally, so they came to the Lord. And they didn't know how to hold on to him because they kept on acting like they did before and they took this miracle for granted somehow. And that is what the problem is. So I talk people, I tell people something they they're, they're, they're going to need to know just to get there and so much more to learn how to hold on to that and know some of the things to expect, some of the some of the dangers and some of the pitfalls that can that can take that miracle away from you. You know, it's like grabbing a slippery fish. It's so hard to hold on to unless you know how to hold on to it through different situations. It tries to slip out of your hand in different ways. And so I want that miracle to stay in us so we can continue to walk in that presence of God. Because the Lord, the uh, Bible says, Paul was talking about, he says, walking in the spirit and we won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Well, a lot of us in the Bible, body of Christ are, are missing that miracle and it's just such a sad thing, and we're, we see a lot of flesh happen because we don't know how to walk in the Spirit rightly. So what I'm hoping for is people to say, I think you're right, I think I can understand what you're saying, and then, and, 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 and then to embrace this and to get some people together and to pray for this thing to happen and to break out so we can all hit, touch the living water in that same magnitude. We can all touch that miracle where we will walk in that thing and not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And I believe the Lord will be able to speak to us will be able to obey, and that's when the, that kingdom will come, and thy will will be done. And that is the fire of God that's really going to turn this world upside down. That's what I'm looking for. So, well, am I saying I'm there? No, I'm not saying I'm there. But I am saying I have definitely seen something of the Lord, and I know it is of God. And it cost a lot. It burned me to the core. It showed me a different place. And I, and, and I have, from there, just being able to say I have seen that, from there, just being able to have seen that makes me understand how to see things that are false. I've been exposed to the truth so much I was doused in it to no end and being able just to be rem just to remember that is enough to see the phonies. And I see the phonies show up in all kinds of different ways, all kinds of different weird manifestations that have happened and people if they have seen the true living water they would say that doesn't make any sense. That doesn't make any sense at all. It does it's like it has a form of godliness but it still doesn't cost anything. But the real gospel costs everything. The real gospel is you to lay down your life. You know, Jesus says, foxes have holes, rabbits have dens, but the, but, the, but the Son of Man has no idea where he's going to lay his head. And thousands of people left. They couldn't stand it. Like, that's crazy. I can't handle that. That's too extreme for me. And then he says, another guy says, I'll follow you. And people are still like, yes, yes, I can do it. And he says, let the dead bury the dead. And you come and follow me and, follow, and preach the gospel. And he wouldn't do it. Thousands more left. And all that was left after three big statements that totally just shocked everybody. They said, wow, that's too much. Well, I believe that's what it costs, though. I believe if it hasn't cost you a lot, then I can't even say biblically you have even met the real Jesus. The Bible preaches about another Jesus that will come out. And I, I would go as far as to say that there is a bunch of Jesuses out there, that, and most of them are wrong. 
And that sounds so mean because people are very sincere. I admire your sincerity. But I don't admire lies. And I will not stand for a lie. If I don't see that miracle that God has shown me, I will never say amen to what you're talking about. I see people get on there and they show me what they did in the flesh. They do like little art designs and they try to say, oh, and, and it kind of reminds me of a scripture or something like that. No, it doesn't. You're just trying to combine what you do to something great and put a little religiousness on it. That has no power at all. That's just flesh and you try to mix your, your made-up religion with what, you, what you've been doing all along. It reminds me of the Corinthians church. Acting like mere men, he said. And ultimately he was saying you're completely off target. You guys have dove completely into spiritual gifts that are given to you without repentance. But without repentance, no one will see God. That is the fine linen, the righteous acts, the righteous deeds. That is something that you have to have. That you, the church will clothe herself with that before they see the Lord. And why to fall into all the weird manifestations the Bible has clearly warned us about? Gold does falling from the sky, and they say that, oh, this is, this is of God. It's a form of God. It's a form of godliness, but it denies the cost to pick up your cross and follow the Jesus of the Scriptures. It is false religion. If you've ever touched the real living water, you would know that, but you haven't, because you haven't counted the cost. And I won't stand for lies at all. If it doesn't look like my Jesus that cost me my life to touch him and to touch that throne, to touch that holiness, then I don't want to hear about it. If you've got some kind of gospel that allows you to continue living in sin, I tell you, it's not of God at all. Give it back to the devil, because it came from him. One thing gives God the glory and it was born in heaven. One thing gives your pride glory, and it came from hell. Cut that junk out and cut it out now. It is not of God. It never was. I don't want to see history repeat itself where, we, where the body of Christ constantly falls into deception. You're after signs and wonders. Watch out for the devil. He's there. leading you. You dove into it hook, line, and sinker because you don't know the word of God. You want miracles, but you don't know the word. You're crazy. The devil's got you. There's going to be so much miracles that's going to deceive so many people, even the elect. People say that the elect won't be deceived. I say that they might try. The devil's sure going to try almost to deceive him. That's why the time at the end had to be cut short. So his elect won't be deceived. I believe that's the true church. The ones who won't fall for every stupid thing that comes down the pike. People are more interested in talking about some calling and some anointing and some miracle that they can do. And they brag about all this stuff that they've going on while they aren't even hearing from God. But Jesus says, my sheep will know my voice and they will obey. But I see charismatic meetings all the time. And people are so confident to give a word to everybody else. But when they're home, they're like, oh God, I don't even know you. So I might as well go bow down before my idol. And they turn on their TV for five hours and they turn on their Bible for about five minutes. Behold the power of God. Oh, but I felt something. False religion, we'll, you'll feel something in false religion, that's for sure. But you'll know in your heart that it is not God. He says, my sheep will hear my voice and they will obey. I want to know when you've been hearing him. I want to know when you wrestle with God in the prayer closet. I want to see the church wrestle with God and come out looking different. When you wrestle with God, you get beat up in there sometimes and you come out limping like Jacob. He wrestled with God all night long, and he came out looking different. If you wrestle with God and you win, that means you've disobeyed God, and you are not walking in the fear of God. It's your own made-up version of it. And I tell you, there will be no power. You'll have every form of religion except for the commission. Preach the gospel to every living creature, to convince, to rebuke, and exhort. It's a stinging message. We're supposed to be the salt and the light. 
not a basket of bunnies. I'd much rather have someone tell me the truth and get me out of the flames of hell than comfort me for a five minutes and give me some, like, quick fix pacifier and send me on a roller coaster to hell. That's called false prophets. I want to know about when, you got, when, you, when you've been hearing from the Lord. Are you addicted to his word? Are you addicted to truth? Can you go very long without worship? Are you, are, is that who you are? I see Christians all the time. They sit in front of their TV so much. I'm like, how in the world do you survive that? I thought you were born again of the God who can't stand that stuff. The TV is run by the prince of the power of the airwaves. Soaking up all the faith that has been instilled into you every Sunday, and he sucks it right out of you. So you constantly take it in, and he takes it right back out of you. You go to God's house and say, God, fill me with faith. And then you go home and say, devil, fill me with no unbelief. And he will gladly do that. And he gets six days. And God gets one day. Imagine who's going to win. Well, I'm sick and tired of seeing the devil win. I'm sick and tired of seeing our kids listen to Marilyn Manson. I am sick to death of watching the body of Christ fall into sin. God hates 